Good morning. I know that verse is hanging in all of your homes, that passage in every room embroidered with all sorts of beautiful artwork. We love it. Judge not that you be not judged. Judge not that you be not judged. This might be the most abused, misused, and left for dead on the side of the road verses in the entire Bible. I imagine that if you've ever engaged someone in any sort of philosophical discussion about morality, then at some point this was dropped on the table. It's the ace in the hole. It says, well, who are you? Who are you to judge? Who are you to say what's right and wrong for another person? And it's used as though what Jesus means in verse 1 It's used as though what he means is don't judge anything or anybody. That's what he's saying. No judgment. Don't judge anything or anybody. As though he outlaws any objective standards of truth that might imply that someone else comes up short. Now, our culture loves that. If our culture had to pick a life verse, that would be it. Because it says... The worst thing that you could do is pass judgment over another person's actions or lifestyle choices. It says the worst kind of person is a judgmental one. And you know you got to feel sorry for the Karens of this world. Because their poor name has been hijacked to describe the most judgmental and hypercritical person that you see online that everybody loves to hate. We hate judgmental people. And so our culture would hear Jesus say, judge not and applaud. Because the highest form of virtue is non-judgmental acceptance. And we see that everywhere. From advertisements, billboards, flags, Disney movies, corporate HR policies. And we boiled it down into phrases like, I'm living my truth. Phrases like, well, you do you. And all of that sounds really sweet and accepting, except for the fact that none of it's actually true. Not a bit of it. Our culture is a hypocritical mess. It professes one thing and does another. If non-judgmental acceptance really was a value, then why is cancel culture just such a thing? I know a lot of you feel this hypocritical inconsistency in your job because what's communicated to you as an employee from on high is that, you know, we are so committed to non-judgmental acceptance here that you will be rejected if you do not accept it. And why have I heard so many people say just something to the effect of, you know, well, I thought about posting about that online on social media, but I didn't. Why? Because I didn't want to be judged for it. And even though we hear the chorus of non-judgmental accepting virtue, we know that we live in a judgmental world that is ruthless and unforgiving. We live inside of a judgmental, hypocritical mess. And Jesus is saying today, my people will be different. My people will be different. You will look and act differently than that judgmental, hypocritical mess that you live inside. Because let's understand something. Sometimes we can think of the past as Jesus is speaking to this sweet agrarian society with gentle music always playing? No. The past, the point at which Jesus is speaking into in this culture that he's addressing was no different than ours. It was just as tribalized and fractured with all of the judgmental venom to go with it. You had zealots, you had Pharisees, you had Sadducees, you had Ascends, you had pro-Roman groups, anti-Roman groups, extremists, you had conformists, divided on religion and politics and everything in between. And if they had the chance, their comment sections would have looked no less toxic than ours. 
And so if all that's true, then is Jesus just simply saying, guys, stop it? No judging allowed. Can't you guys just get along? Can't you just accept each other? Our culture would say, yes, that's what he's saying, but he's not. This has nothing to do with tolerance or acceptance. Full stop. It has everything to do with confession and being confronted. And part of the problem that this verse gets used out of context is because it gets extracted from the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. Because in the Sermon on the Mount, all the way up to this point, Jesus has made all sorts of judgments about all sorts of behaviors and actions and motives. His favorite word this whole time has been hypocrite, to repeatedly draw attention to behavior that's self-deceived, that judges incorrectly because it's not aligned with the nature and the character of God. So to think all of a sudden that now Jesus just comes to the end of the Sermon on the Mount and he says, well, don't judge anybody. That's silly because truth matters. And truth requires judgment. But at the same time, we cannot lose sight of something important. Because how many of you have been hurt by a church experience in the past because of a deeply judgmental culture? Let's not pretend the church can eat her own. Maybe that's you. Maybe the day, first day you showed up here, it was a big hurdle to walk through that door. You were hoping for this place to be a little bit different than the hand you'd been dealt. It's not that you didn't want to hear the truth. You just didn't want so much anger. You didn't want so much toxicity. You just didn't want those cold eyes of judgment constantly upon you. Maybe you opened up in the past and you thought you were in a safe place to be honest, but from then on you were always on the outside looking in. You felt that You felt that rejection that was covered up by a sweet smile? But you always felt that cold gaze of judgment on you. On the one hand, we know that as Christians, we're supposed to make sound judgments. But how we make those judgments matters too. Otherwise, we'll look no different than the surrounding world that divorces truth from love. And if you want to follow Jesus, you cannot separate truth from love. You're following a figment of your own imagination. Because love took on flesh and love spoke truth. So what does love have to say to us? He's teaching us how to be a different kind of people. He's teaching us how to be a different kind of people than everywhere and anywhere else you look to be people that can hold on to truth and love at the exact same time. And so that's my interest in this passage for us. How can we be that type of church that holds together truth and love? How do you make sound judgments but reject judgmentalism? How can we be a church that offers the truth of Christ and the embrace of Christ at the exact same time? Because I want us to be a church where people change. To be a church where people experience real gospel transformation. Real living waters flowing out of us. For there to be so many stories here where people who once thought of the church as a source of pain started to think of it as something precious. It could be a place where people start to trust the church again. Because it's here that they experience the power of Jesus. To be a place where people can heal and embrace the life of holiness at the same time. To be a place that says, come as you are. But also says, who you are can change. And it's in this passage that Jesus is teaching us how to be different to be a different kind of people than the rest of this judgmental, hypocritical world? How do we become a people that embrace the truth of Christ and the embrace of Christ at the exact same time and offer that to one another and to the world around us? 
Judge not, lest you be judged. To understand what Jesus is saying, we actually have to get on his level. And honestly, it's a bit tricky because this is a, it's a hard passage and it's a nuanced passage. And verse 6 is the hardest verse to translate in the Sermon on the Mount. One of the issues for why this verse is misused, at least part of it, is how it's translated and then interpreted 2,000 years later. Words change meaning over time. They don't always mean the exact same thing from 100 years ago that they mean now. The word nice centuries ago used to mean dumb and stupid. Now it means someone who's kind, considerate. A few hundred years ago, you don't want to be nice. Nowadays, you do want to be nice. Words change meaning over time. And Jesus uses the word judge. And the translational gap between 2,000 years ago and today about the word judge is an ocean of difference. Because Jesus uses that word judge, but not in the way that we think of it. Because in our modern world, we hear the word judge and we think of it as a derogatory term because we interpret it and think of it as negative and we think of it narrowly. How so? Well, we think that to judge something is the same thing as condemning something. To judge is to condemn. And so, of course, modern people hear this verse, they see that and they say, see, Jesus says don't judge. You can't judge me because you... You can't condemn me, so therefore, don't judge. In a sense, yes, Jesus is saying, don't condemn people. That's not our job. We're not called to be the judge and jury. But if we think of the word judge in such a narrow manner, then we actually miss everything that Jesus is saying. It is completely lost on us. Because that's not how he uses the word here. He is not equating judging and condemning when he says, judge not. Because for him, in his context, the word judge carried a much broader range of meaning. It also included discernment and justice. It's discernment, justice, being executed. That doesn't always have to be a bad thing. And some translations try to get at this broader meaning by translating the verse this way. Do not judge unfairly. Do not judge unfairly. And that sense of fairness comes out in verse 2 when Jesus says that the measure by which you judge others, you yourself will be measured. It's a reference to having balanced scales in the way that you see yourself and others. And so why point all this out? Well, Because it means that Jesus is not saying that you can't ever judge anything or anyone at all. Yes, he's saying, don't condemn people. But he's saying, make right judgments about them. Be just. Be fair. Evaluate and discern rightly. Because he's talking to fallen humans. He's talking to them. He's talking to us. He's talking to people whose natural instincts is to be hypercritical and judge others unfairly in a way that only sees them at their worst, in a way that only sees their flaws. And we write them off according to our own standards of righteousness. It's the condemnation of others that comes from having our own unjust scales from our own judgment. And we judge others unfairly and we condemn them, which means they're not worth my time. They're not worth the effort. They're not worth the relationship. They're not even worth my kindness or compassion. Because the sinful heart is one that loves to slam the gavel and hand out life sentences for everybody else. And Jesus says the reason our our judgment is unfair, the reason it's unfair is because we're blind. We're blind. We are self-deceived. Not about who they are, but about who we are. And to illustrate this, Jesus uses his famous comical image, a little occupational humor from a former construction worker. He says... 
Why is it that you see the speck in your brother's eye? You see that little piece of dust, yet you fail to see that you have got a two-by-four sticking out of your melon. Just right there. Sticking out of your head. You hypocrite. You see the flaws in others. But that's easy. What's hard? It's seeing the flaws in you. Another way he's putting it is you could say, if you care so much about truth, then why don't you apply it to yourself? And we do it all the time in all sorts of different ways. And given that the internet gives us so much access and visibility into the lives of another, boy, that judgment train just leaves the station on, on the regular. You know, you see that, see vacation pics, somebody posts online and you think, well, I wouldn't spend my money like that. There they go again, spending money like it grows on trees. Yet you fail to see the two by four of those $8 Starbucks drinks you like to crush on a daily basis. Or learning that another couple is seeking counseling, trying to get help. And thinking, I'm not surprised. I always knew they were headed for disaster. We've never had to get any counseling, have we, sweetie? Or hating the all the people around us embracing alternative sexualities and lifestyles, and yet we fail to see that two by four of our own lust. And we minimize it because we think at least my sin is heterosexual. At least my sin is more in line with the will of God. We are all the kid who tattles on the other kid for not closing their eyes during prayer time. And here's what Jesus is getting at. What is your standard of righteousness? If it's everybody else, you have a problem of eternal significance. Because remember this whole time, he's been talking about living by a greater righteousness. And here he's talking about how we can live by a lesser righteousness when we use others to justify ourselves. We compare ourselves to others. We find their faults, their flaws, the way they don't measure up so that we feel better about who and what we are and what we've done. And we can so easily minimize this. We can think of it, honestly, we say, well, sure, yeah, I can be kind of hard on people every now and then, but that's just kind of a little personality flaw. It's a little, little hiccup on the radar of my morality. But no, Jesus says, no, this problem is much bigger than you think. And it has eternal significance. Why? For two reasons. One, unfair judgment destroys community. Unfair judgment destroys community. That's obvious. It's why no one showed up here today for the first time and said on the way, well, sweetie, I'm hoping this new church sure is judgmental. Wouldn't that be nice? Now, who wants to be a part of that? That kind of toxicity. The judgmental, critical spirit destroys community, or more particularly, it destroys marriages. It destroys friendships. It destroys peace and wholeness and unity. It destroys everything that differentiates us from the rest of the world. But why is it so destructive? Well, it's because of what it has to do to survive. If you actually see this problem closely, you see it from the very beginning of the biblical story. It's really the second response of sinful humanity. The first was to hide. The second one was this one, to cover up. 
Because after the fall, when God confronts Adam and Eve, he asks Adam, did you eat of the tree that I commanded you not to eat? What does Adam say? He says, it was the woman you gave me. It was the woman that you gave me. Do you see what he did? He condemns another to justify himself. He absolves himself of any wrongdoing by pointing out the flaws in the actions of another. But underneath that is the really sad part because have you ever noticed that Adam doesn't even use her name? He doesn't even give her the dignity of having a name. He says, it was the woman that you gave me. In order to justify himself, he has to dehumanize her. He has to make her something small and insignificant in his own eyes, which is really sad because that's the very bride that he sang over just a few verses before. But now he treats her like she's just a nameless failure that, can, that he can only see in light of her greatest mistake. All the while, he doesn't see the two by four sticking out of his own head. A judgmental, critical spirit destroys community because the only way that it can survive is to minimize and dehumanize others so that it can feel good about itself. It passes verdicts over the value of others and it sees them at their worst. It magnifies those flaws. Why? Because it's actually rooted in their own insecurity. If we are judgmental, we are not confident. It's not from a place of strength. It's from a deep wound of insecurity. And it will only bear the fruit of loneliness. Have you ever known a judgmental person who was rich in relationships? Have you ever known a judgmental person that was approachable? Have you ever known a judgmental person that had a marriage that you wanted? Secondly, unfair judgment cuts God out, to put it bluntly. It disregards the living God who from start to finish has written a story of truth and mercy, truth and compassion. Truth and grace, truth and love. A few chapters later, Jesus tells the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. They both show up to the temple. And they both show up to pray. And the Pharisee says, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. I thank you that I am not like extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like that tax collector over there. And so do you notice how he only sees people, how? In their failures. But he only sees himself in his strengths. He says, well, I fast twice a week. I give of all that I have. So you kind of wonder if God in the parable thought back, then why are you here? Why are you talking to me? But on the other side of that sanctuary was a tax collector who simply says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. You see the difference? It's a life and death difference. Because the Pharisee can only see how others have failed God, while the tax collector sees how he himself failed God. One fixes his gaze upon the Lord himself. The other cuts God completely out of the equation and he fixes his gaze on everybody else. And so one walked away justified. The other walked away condemned. Jesus wants us to take judgmentalism seriously. It's not a personality flaw. It's an issue of eternal significance. Why? Because inside the judgmental heart, there's no room for love of God and love for others. Which is why, how can you then say, I value truth, when the entirety 
of our Lord's revelation is built on love of God and love of neighbor. This is why the way that we judge others has eternal significance. It's also why Jesus says that you will be judged with the same judgment that you place upon others. <laughs> you will be judged with the same judgment you place upon others. Boy, that's not scary or anything, is it? I find that really fascinating. It's like, it's like he says, what will the day of judgment be like for you? It'll be like what you think of everybody else. It's a scary thought. As though the Father says, I'm not even going to get to Jesus. My real standard of righteousness, you don't even measure up to your own. It's enough to condemn you. It is a powerful statement. But it's also no, no different than what Jesus has been saying this whole time to us. He says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. If you forgive others, then your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, he will not forgive you. And then he says here, the way you judge others will be how you too are judged. And he keeps saying these things. Why does mercy and forgiveness and fair judgment have such eternal significance? It's because what you give others is just a reflection of what you think you've received. What we give to others is just a reflection of what we think we have received. And so if you feel like you've, you have little to be forgiven for, then you'll offer very little forgiveness. If you feel like you need little mercy, you'll offer little in return. If you think that you've gotten where you are because of your choices and your abilities and your strengths and your weaknesses, then everybody isn't where you are because they didn't exercise the same choices and strengths as you did. And so they're worthy of judgment. And yet all the while God gets cut out. We can think that we have it all together and we can offer such little grace to others. But Jesus says, my people will be different. They will be full of truth and mercy and grace. That's why he's teaching us how to be a community that sees one another in light of who God is and who we are. And if we forget that, it all falls apart. He's bringing us to a place where love of God and love of neighbor is that glue that operates between me and you. So Jesus says, before you take that speck out of your brother's eye, he says, deal with that two by four sticking out of your head first. And make no mistake, Jesus is not saying, well, if you notice a fault in your brother, don't say anything because you've got your own problems, buddy. No, he's not saying that at all. Jesus is talking about that simple yet oh so difficult activity of evaluating your own heart first. To not wait for your spouse to apologize. And then if it's good enough, you'll apologize. So what's your standard of righteousness? Them or your Savior? It's being willing to recognize our own faults and failures before we address those of another. It's the willingness to stop and confess of repent and repent of our sins in our own heart. Why? Because that introduces God back into how you see yourself and how we see others. That's when his truth starts to become that measuring stick by which we evaluate others and ourselves. That's when you're no longer operating by all of your own standards of righteousness, but we start operating by his. And who could possibly stand before that? Confession reminds us of who we are. And Jesus is inviting us to confess. Yeah, see that flaw in your brother, but say to yourself, or say to your God, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. It's placing the truth of God's standards over our own life and just that willingness to also see our own weaknesses 
our own failures and addictions and vices in realizing that apart from his mercy and his grace, we are all condemned. It's a heart-softening realization. That's why Jesus says in verse 5, when you take that log out of your own eye, then you will see clearly. Then you will be able to actually help take out the speck in your brother's eye. He's saying the judgmental person just wants everybody else to change. But confession changes you. Produces a completely different posture towards the other. Just think about it. Think about your marriage for a second. If you said to your spouse, look, I know there's a lot of tension between us. We've just come to this brick wall we can't seem to get past. But I want to own. I want to own what's mine to own. I messed up. I've said things I shouldn't have. I haven't been tender. I haven't been kind. Will you forgive me? Would you... Give me the gift of your compassion. Or you can just wait for the other person to apologize first. Confession changes us. And that produces a different kind of community. That's a community that walks humbly, that engages gently, and deals honestly and truthfully with one another. It's a community that God will use to change lives. Why? Because it's a community that has received the truth of Christ and the embrace of Christ. And now we're ready to offer that to the world. Jesus says one last thing in this passage that I stood out the window a lot this week thinking about it. Because I think it's a statement that he makes to show how serious he is about this issue. Because... He knows how deeply rooted our self-deception can be. Because even now, after hearing all of that, we can still think to ourselves, yeah, I know I'm not perfect, I've got stuff too, but my spouse really needs to change. He knows how quickly we want to crawl out from under the microscope. He knows how quickly we think of someone else who needs to hear all this. He knows how quickly we literally shut down when the attention gets turned on us. And admittedly, this whole passage is nuanced, and what makes it the hardest is verse 6. Here's what Jesus says. Do not give dogs what is holy. Do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. Do not give dogs what is holy. Do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. What in the world is Jesus talking about? Well, for one, the terms dogs and pigs, they're derogatory terms, yes. But Jesus isn't using them as derogatory terms to insult someone. He's not using them as insults to comment on their value or just inherent image of God, dignity, and identity. These are words that were commonly used to refer to someone who is outside the covenant community of faith. Gentiles. Someone who is ignorant and antagonistic towards the things of God. And so dogs were not domesticated. They were wild unclean animals roaming the streets. Pigs were unclean and forbidden to eat. And so these terms became synonymous with those who were outside the covenant community of faith, who were antagonistic to God, who lived like the fool in the book of Proverbs, who didn't appreciate beauty and holiness and goodness and truth. And so Interpretations on that, that verse vary quite a bit. And the most common one is that since 
Jesus says this right after he talks about going to your brother. Then it must mean that he's telling us to be careful who we approach the truth with. Since some people can't hear the truth, then we need to evaluate whether or not the other person is in a place to be able to receive it and treasure the truth, lest they trample on it and attack us. And the reference where Jesus tells the disciples that if a town or a village does not receive them to dust off their feet and move on. Because some people are so antagonistic to the truth that we simply recognize it and we move on. There's certainly a case to be made for that interpretation. But I do not think that's what Jesus is doing here at all. I think that misses the point. It doesn't sit well with me for a couple of reasons. The first is that when Jesus tells the disciples to dust off their feet, he's talking about evangelism. Where they are carrying the gospel to unreached people and places. That's not what Jesus is talking about here. He's talking about going to your brother. But secondly, Jesus just talked and spent so much time and emphasis on the importance of self-examination and examining your own heart. So it seems strange to think that now he's just changed the subject and encouraging you to start examining everybody around you as either a dog or a pig. Doesn't seem to make much sense, does it? Nor does it seem to match the spirit of what Jesus is saying. So what is he saying? Jesus speaks that verse like it's almost directly out of Proverbs, right? It sounds like a little wisdom aphorism. Why? Because he's speaking also in the Sermon on the Mount as the wise sage, as the one who says what wisdom truly is as wisdom itself. So that phrase is thrown in there, I think, to pull out that deep root of self-deception and judgmentalism that's there. And he says that to get us to think more deeply and reflect more seriously on ourselves. Think of it like this. It's like when Jesus says at the end of his teaching elsewhere, when he says, let those who have ears to hear, let them hear. He says it so that someone might hear that and go into a deeper self-examination. I think that's exactly why Jesus says this here. I don't think he's giving it to us so that he would give us a little set of glasses so that we can look out at everybody else and decide whether they're dogs and pigs. He's giving us a mirror. He's giving us a mirror so that we might see ourselves. To say I haven't valued and treasured what is holy and true. I've lived like one who's outside the covenant. I've lived like I don't know the truth. I've lived like I haven't heard it. I've trampled on what God says is beautiful and good and righteous and holy. I haven't treasured who he is. I haven't treasured what he says I am and what he's done for me. I bite back at the hand of his conviction. I attack his truth when it says the hard thing about me. I've disregarded his words and I haven't let it shape how I see the world and everyone around me and myself. So in other words, he's inviting you to make the most important judgment of all. I am the pig. I am the dog. I've been given something so precious and so priceless and my judgmental heart has trampled all over it. And that's truth that hits hard. But receiving that truth is the only way to also receive the love that goes with it. Because the real question then is what does Jesus do with dogs and pigs? When Jesus hung on the cross, he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's a direct quote from Psalm 22, but Jesus isn't quoting the psalm. The psalm is quoting the crucifixion. 
Jesus is living it. Psalm 22 is the cross happening in real time. And inside of that psalm, it says this, For dogs have surrounded me. They pierced my hands and my feet. They tear me apart and rip up my garments, deliver my precious life from the power of the dog. Friends, at the cross, there is no righteous or unrighteous. There is no Jew or Gentile. There is no insider. There is no outsider. There are only sinners and a Savior. So what does Jesus do for the dogs? He takes all the judgment that was theirs, and he dies for them. And he domesticates them in the house of his father by his mercy and his grace. And what about those pigs? What does he do for those who see that reflection? If the Spirit would give the gift of clarity in that reflection, what does he do for those that realize they've been spending a lot of time in the swine heap? Well, one of the most beautiful things and stories Jesus tells is about someone who found themselves in that very spot. The prodigal son who woke up about who he was, about all that he'd done, about all of his failures, all of his mistakes, as he's eating out of the trough with all the swine covered in the same muck and filth as they were, living like a pig. And he thinks to himself in the truth and realization of who he is, if I could just go back to my father's house and receive just the slightest bit of mercy so that he would feed me from the scraps of his table. So he goes home, and what does he find? What does he find after he realizes the truth of who he is? He finds a loving embrace. He sees that front door swing wide open. And he sees the loving embrace of his father running to him with outstretched arms all the way down that long driveway with tears in his father's eyes and those old man legs hardly being able to keep up with how much his heart was compelled towards his filthy son. And he wipes the mud off his face. He puts rings on his fingers. And he puts a robe on his back. And it's his love that turns a pig into a prince. For the glory of Christ and the life of the world. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, would you give us the grace and mercy of conviction? Would you give us the grace and mercy of eyes that can see us? Would you allow us to embrace your truth as precious and beautiful? Would you allow us to see sin and make right judgments whenever, however, and wherever we see it? Not just in the world around us, but in our own hearts, in our own lives. We ask that you would soften our hearts towards you, towards one another. And we do ask that you would transform us collectively as this body and this family of people that you have brought together. For this place and this time, for your purposes. That we embrace the sweetness and the sting of your truth that you speak to us. And might we also know the loving embrace that you offer to us with it. We ask that you would meet us at this table. We ask that you would feed us with the very life that you offer to us in the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Strengthen us, grace us, and be merciful towards us. We ask all this in your precious name. Amen.